Okay, welcome everyone. We will, uh, I guess, go ahead and begin. Thank you for joining us. This is Ethics Grand Rounds at University of Colorado Hospital. And um, we have a wonderful presentation uh, this afternoon. So um, glad that you are all here and wanted to remind you that um, that any comments or questions you have, if you would use the chat function, um, we will get to those. I am Reverend Julie Sweeney. I'm the Director of Spiritual Care Services and the co-chair of the um, UCH Ethics Committee. Um, we have a group of folks, um, including Dr. Jackie Glover, who are part of Planning Ethics Grand Rounds Monthly. So we are really pleased this month, um, with very good timing, um, to have Martha Gershon with us. And um, this is um, a, a topic that um, is of utmost interest in many ways around um, kidney to share, a living kidney donors experience and lessons learned about barriers and opportunities. And this will be presented by Martha Gershon. Um, and she ha has recently written a book with physician and bioethicist, John Lantos. Um, Dr. Lantos couldn't be with us today, but, but Martha is gonna speak to her experience as a, a kidney donor. Um, by way of introduction, um, Martha is a nonprofit consultant, uh, writer, and community volunteer. Previously, she was the executive director of Jackson County CASA, which stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, and the Reach Out and Read National Center. She's author of Care and Custody, a novel of three children at risk. And this year, she published her book, Kidney to Share, um, as I mentioned with Dr. Lantos. Um, Martha graduated from Harvard College and holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, where she studied service operations and customer experience. In 2018, of particular relevance to us today, she donated a kidney at the Mayo Clinic to a woman she read about in the newspaper. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Martha. And thank you very much, Martha, for being with us. We look forward to the talk. She will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will have time for comments and questions from all of you. So thanks, Martha. That's lovely. Thanks so much. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if that works. There we go. Are you all seeing that okay? Yep, looks good. Terrific. Thank you all so much for having me here. Um, as was said in the introduction, I co-wrote a book about my experience as a living kidney donor with physician and bioethicist, Dr. John Lantos. And often he joins me on these talks. Today, he happens to be at a conference for bioethics and humanities experts. And so we are losing him today, but I'm gonna do my best to weave in much of what I've learned from John around the bioethics of organ transplantation, as well as my own experiences. It should come as no surprise to anyone in this country that we need more kidney donors. There are 90,765 people on the kidney waiting list today. And we know that more than a dozen of them will die waiting on the list. There will not be enough organs to save them. And we also know that these folks would be better off with a kidney transplant from a living donor than a cadaveric donor, if it's possible. Living donors offer the opportunity for a better histocompatible match. The kidney typically spends less time out of the body. It goes from one warm body right just across the hall into another one. And the opportunity to schedule the surgery essentially is an elective procedure. When it works for the surgeons, when it works for the recipient, is much more likely to maximize health outcomes instead of that middle of the night call, which says, we have an organ come now. But very few people donate. In 2020, there were only 17,163 kidney donors in the country. 
And of those, over 11,000 were deceased donors. Now, one interesting thing about these numbers, as you can well guess, a deceased donor can possibly donate two kidneys. A living donor can only donate one. And so we end up with more patients who are served than these numbers show. But you can see 70% of the donors in this country in 2020 were people who had already died. There were only 5,238 living donors. And of those, the largest portion donated to a relative, to a spouse or life partner, or donated to a paired exchange, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, to benefit a relative or a life partner or a friend. Very few fall in the category that I fall in called altruistic living kidney donors. We are the people who donated to someone we didn't know, either anonymously or a directed unrelated donation, someone that we heard about or learned about and decided to try and help. This is a painting of a photograph that was actually in a museum uh, here in Kansas where I live. Someone had painted over a sign in the middle of a field, I need a kidney. And I thought the pathos of this piece of art is really striking. It speaks to the desperation of people who need an organ to save their lives and the, the great effort and significant difficulty that they often have to go to to find what they need. This is another example. Um, Good Housekeeping wrote an article, Miracle on Facebook. This is someone who, through a Facebook post, was able to find their living donor. And as you can see, the American Transplant Foundation actually teaches kidney patients how to crowdsource for an organ, how to mount their own marketing campaigns. If you think about it, it's a pretty unusual way to access healthcare. We see examples of people crowdfunding, crowdsourcing for financial resources to pay for treatment. But the idea of crowdsourcing for the item, for the piece of the supply chain that will save your life is essentially unique to organ transplantation. Early on in the history of organ transplantation, we didn't even let people donate to someone they didn't know. It makes sense given the medical history of the procedure. Early on in the 1950s, when the very first living transplants for all organs were done, we didn't understand issues of histocompatibility. We didn't understand organ rejection yet. All we knew is that very close biological relatives living could typically donate an organ to a relative and it would probably take. And the very earliest transplants were done between identical twins where histocompatibility wasn't a problem. But the science got better and we learned about histocompatibility. We learned how to test for matches and corticosteroids were developed that could suppress the immune system in ways that let organ recipients hold on to an organ from someone else's body. One of the most interesting things about this field to me as a non-clinician was this notion that the body recognizes tissue that is not its own as other and it attacks it. That's how we protect ourselves from virus and from bacteria. It's also how we can end up rejecting an organ. But the closer a match you can get and the better immunosuppressant regimen you can put the patient on post-transplantation, the odds of this working got better and better. And that led to some people like me saying, I have two kidneys, I don't need both of them, maybe I can help someone. I don't know anybody today, there isn't someone in my family, my spouse doesn't need a kidney, but maybe I can help. And early on, doctors were very concerned about people like that. They thought we were nuts. They were concerned that living donors might be coerced. Um, they were concerned that this might not be voluntary. And they were concerned that we might be nuts, that we might be over-sacrificing, putting our own health at risk inappropriately, excessively. It makes sense 
It didn't make a lot of sense to me as someone who chose to do it, but it makes sense if you think about transplant surgeons who are going to cut open a healthy person, someone that nothing is wrong with, and no matter how good they do their job, they're going to leave them less well off. They're going to leave them missing what is typically considered a pretty fundamental body part. And so transplant surgeons were pretty resistant about doing that. They were less resistant about doing it for relatives because it was understood that there was an emotional benefit to saving a member of your family, that helping a parent save the life of their child, helping an adult child save the life of a parent offered a kind of emotional compensation that made the risk to someone's body worth it. But stranger donors were really considered a different question. You can see some of the psychological benefits they talked about with a, a initially relationship donations and then eventually stranger donations. The idea that this might enhance a loving relationship with a sibling, with a parent, with a child, with a spouse. It might lead to great, greater self-esteem on the part of the donor. There is a sense that donors might be seen as a hero by their family, their friends, their classmates, by the whole community. And also in family donations, the thought that by donating to a member of the family, you might relieve other members of the family with the burden of caregiving, the burden of dialysis, the burdens of medication. If one sibling, for instance, could donate to a parent, they might be relieving a significant burden that other siblings are, are choosing to bear. In the early days of organ transplantation, coercion was a major concern. And in fact, organs were being trafficked internationally, and you still hear about that today, not very much in the United States, um, more in the third world, sometimes in, in developing in developed countries. In response to concerns about underground organ selling, the United Kingdom actually made it illegal to donate to someone who is not a biological relative. Now, from my point of view, that doesn't necessarily take away the question of coercion. As you all know, your family can coerce you, as can strangers, but it did possibly take away the, the issues of monetary coercion or physical violence coercion. And in 1990, they passed the UK Human Organ Transplant Act to make this kind of activity illegal. It also would have prohibited the kind of organ donation that I participated in. This was eventually challenged. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court in the UK and it was overturned. A woman who was a hospice nurse who had spent her life caring for people at the end of death, who had seen people in serious kidney failure, felt that she could donate her kidney and she wanted to and she fought both the medical system and the legal system so that this organ transplant act was eventually overturned. We never had a law like that in the United States. Pretty early on, it was understood that people might have reasons to do this besides direct family relationships. So we get to my story. This, the pretty blonde, is Deb Porter Gill. Deb is a woman that I read about in the Jewish Chronicle. The story I read said that she was 56. She was the mother of two. She had trained as a lawyer and practiced as a child protection lawyer for many years, and she needed a kidney. In fact, Deb's medical story is quite interesting. She developed diabetes when she was in law school. Her kidneys in an unrelated medical situation began to fail. She did not have a family history of the disease. And there wasn't a clear diagnosis like polycystic kidney disease, which we often hear about. And by the time she was in her early 30s, Deb was on the transplant waiting list for both a kidney and a pancreas. We don't do living organ donors for pancreas. You can't give your pancreas to someone else. You actually need all of them. And so at that time, Deb received a donation from a cadaveric donor, a woman in her 40s who was killed in an automobile accident. And her organs went all over the country, saved many lives, 
including Deb's. And so Deb had received a kidney pancreas transplant. She went on to live a happy, healthy life uh, along with her husband, adopted two children from Russia, participated fully in the community, and then the kidney started to fail. She held on to it for 18 years. That is longer than the average cadaveric kidney lasts. And her pancreas were still going fine, but she needed a new kidney. And the transplant clinic told her that she probably wouldn't survive waiting for a cadaveric donor, that she needed one pretty soon. And the transplant waiting list was pretty long. In fact, her first experience needing both a pancreas and a kidney probably put her higher up on the list the first time than she was going to be the second time. And so Deb began some social outreach to see if she could find a living donor. Deb lives in Fort Lauderdale. However, she had been born and raised, not born, but raised in Kansas City, which is where I live. And she reached out to the Kansas City Jewish Chronicle, which ran a full page article. And I read it and I thought, I think I can do this. It was perfect timing. I had very recently retired from my work with abused and neglected children. That meant I had time on my hands. I didn't have to worry about missing work or putting the agency that I run into a difficult situation if I were to take a great deal of time off. Our kids had already grown up, gone to college, had apartments. There wasn't a concern about childcare. There was not in our family a concern about elder care with older adult relatives. And my husband had a stable job and was able to offer support, which is very important through this process. In fact, transplant clinics typically won't accept you as a donor if you don't have a caregiver who has the time to assist. Kidney donation was not a new idea to me. I have a cousin in Omaha, Nebraska, who had received a living kidney donation almost 20 years before. Uh, my cousin Anne uh, did have polycystic kidney disease, the most common inherited disease in our country. And by the time she was in her 50s, her kidneys were failing. Some of us in the family at the time thought about whether or not we could be donors. I, I never got very far in that process. Uh, Anne is married to my biological cousin. She's not a biological relative. We weren't even the same blood type. There was, no, there was really no way I could participate in that. But a very dear family friend was a perfect match and in fact donated to my cousin at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in 2002 and lived another nine years very important years in the life of my family. She was able to come to my son's bar mitzvah, my daughter's bat mitzvah. Later when my mother died, she was able to join us for the memorial service. I went up to Omaha for many Thanksgiving dinners at her house. I knew firsthand that a living kidney donation, a living kidney donor could not just save a life, but could bring meaning and joy and love to a family. And so when I read about Deb, and I was retired and I had time on my hands and I already knew what great joy this blessing could bring. I thought, I'm gonna give it a try. Now I wasn't naive. The odds of any individual matching with a specific other individual is really quite low. If you're not biologically related, it's about one in a hundred thousand. And so often when people say, oh, you're such a living saint, you're such a hero. The truth is, I didn't start out saying, give my kidney to Deb. I started out saying, let's play the lottery and see if I win the one in a hundred thousand chance. I considered the odds that I would actually match to be quite low. And I was happy to try, but it wasn't a guarantee. As it turns out, I was a perfect match for Deb on all six major histocompatibility markers. It was a miracle. Only two people in our community responded to the article in the Jewish Chronicle. The other wasn't even a blood type match. And here I was a perfect, I was a perfect match for this gorgeous blonde who looks just like I had always wanted to look like my whole entire life. It was kind of a miracle. It raises the really interesting question, what else 
we can do to increase the number of people like me who can save lives and who can really enjoy this extraordinary benefit that that I I got to have I got to have with Deb. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. It wasn't hard medically. Uh, the surgery, um, I, I kind of came through it swimmingly and uh, recovered very quickly, had very little pain. Uh, within four weeks after the surgery, my husband and I were in New York City going to Broadway plays. Um, it was difficult logistically and it was difficult bureaucratically. And one of the reasons I wanted to write the book with John was to talk about ways the system could be improved so that more people can do this. So I'll tell you a couple of very brief stories. If you wanna read more, you know where to get the book. Um, these are some of the bureaucratic barriers I encountered. One of the first happened very early in the process. Uh, when I called the clinic to say, I'd like to be tested, they sent me to a website, fill out a health questionnaire. It was all very anticlimactic. Nobody jumped up and down and said, we have a donor. They just, they send you to a website. And I was very transparent. I answered the questions as truthfully as I possibly could. I didn't want to impair Deb's health. I didn't want to put my health at risk. And I answered two questions in a way that I thought were kind of no big deal, but raised significant red flags at the clinic. The first of those was the question, have you ever used recreational drugs? So I wanna tell you ever is a very big, long word. Yes, I have ever used recreational drugs. In fact, sometimes on vacation in your state in Colorado, I've smoked a joint with my husband. I've had an edible before dinner. I happen to live in a state where cannabis is not legal. Uh, the Mayo Clinic where we were going to do the surgery is in a state where cannabis is not legal. And that question, bzz, bzz, big red flags. And when the nurse practitioner at the Mayo Clinic called to tell me that I was a perfect match for Deb, they asked if I would be willing, as a precondition of moving forward with the process, to talk to a substance abuse counselor. Okay, I thought that was way over the top. Coming to Colorado on vacation and smoking a little weed does not throw you in the substance abuse counselor category. But I was trying to save Deb's life and I was in it all the way and I said, sure. The only problem is the Mayo Clinic has a shortage of substance abuse counselors. I think because they probably overprescribed this intervention. And the week that they were able to schedule me to come for all the other tests, uh, kidney function, chest x-ray, uh, CAT scan, meet the surgeon, meet the financial counselor, meet the social worker. I had 24 appointments. They were able to get them all lined up. They couldn't get me a substance abuse counselor appointment for another month, which meant we were delaying the transplant process. It meant if I didn't pass, Deb wasn't gonna be able to start looking for another donor for a month. And it meant that they were expecting me and my husband to travel the six hours from my home up to Rochester, Minnesota a second time, get a hotel again for this one appointment. I thought that was ridiculous. And I said so pretty aggressively, I think pretty persuasively, because in fact, eventually they said, you don't have to do that. I can't help but think that one of the reasons I got out of that requirement is because I am an over 60 year old, upper middle class, pretty articulate, highly educated white woman used to advocating for herself. I do not know if they would have let a 27 year old black man with a minimum wage job, maybe not even strong command of the English language, maybe he came from somewhere else, I don't know that they would have let someone without my privilege out of that requirement. 
I also suspect that there are folks um, who might like to donate a kidney, maybe to save the, the life of a, of a relative, who that very requirement, you must talk to a substance abuse counselor, would be so terrifying. You can see what, how that might sound to an immigrant that they drop out of the process completely. Similarly, when I disclosed on the form that I had seen a mental health counselor sometime in my life, that was a red flag. And they demanded that I have my entire mental health file faxed up to the clinic before they would move me forward. I called my therapist who I hadn't seen in many months. She had helped me figure out that I wanted to retire from paid work, but that had been some months before. I called her and asked her if she'd send my records up if I signed some non-disclosure forms. And she said, absolutely not. This is nobody else's business. Uh, what you've told me about your job, about the people you work with, about your family of origin, I am not sending up for a transplant committee to peruse. I'll write a letter saying that uh, you have no contraindications, saying that you don't have a clinical diagnosis and you're not on medication, but I'm not sending your file up. And once again, they caved. They said they took the letter. But again, you could imagine how somebody without my advocacy skills, without my resources, that might stop, stop someone right there. And you have to wonder if some of these stigmas around recreational cannabis, around mental health counseling, don't relate back to those early concerns that stranger donors might be crazy people. So let's talk about some of the ways we might increase organs to help ailing Americans. One thing we could do is increase cadaveric donation. Uh, in America today, about half, a little more than half of eligible adults have signed their organ donor card. Usually it's their driver's license. You can also register online. As you can see from this chart, um, other countries have a much higher rate of cadaveric organ donation. The United States is, is kind of flopping there. We are fourth after Spain and Croatia. And then the, the Portugal is kind of the lighter blue. Spain and Croatia are pretty interesting. Instead of an opt-in system, which is what we have here, you have to opt in on your driver's license or on the website. They have an opt-out system. They presume consent. You can opt out, but if you don't opt out, they presume that your organs are going to be used for the common good. There are a lot of questions about whether or not we should test this in America. I think there's some reasons in our current health crisis to suspect that people um, would prioritize individual decision-making and individual liberty over the common good, but we could test it. Uh, we have something called the laboratory of the states. We have 50 states. We could try it in one and see if it increased cadaveric organ donation. That could make a big difference. Many people talk about the markets for organs. Could we set a price that the federal government will pay for a kidney, $10,000? Would that increase the number of people who come forward? We don't know. It's never been tested, but we do know some other things. We know that you can legally sell these body parts in America. You can sell, if you're a woman, you can sell your eggs for ten dollars to $30,000. If you're a guy, you can sell your sperm for five dollars to $15,000. Uh, you can sell breast milk. The question mark is because the price is, is set individually. You can sell your bone marrow, your blood plasma, your hair, and you can't sell your uterus, but you can rent your uterus for about $45,000 if you want to be a surrogate. And yet, we don't let people sell organs. There are lots and lots of reasons um, some are the idea about coercion, that it would rich people would get poor people to give them their organs. And, and there's some really creepy science fiction books written about that. There are some issues around exploitation, uh, that it is wrong to treat someone as the, as the sum of their body parts. But there are also some good arguments in favor of markets, respect for individual autonomy. Uh, if I would like to sell my kidney, who are you to tell me I can't? It would certainly save lives. We absolutely know that we need more organs. And it would be consistent with other practices that we permit in this country that are very, very dangerous. 
It is much more dangerous to work in the forestry industry as a logging worker. It is more dangerous to be an aircraft pilot or a flight engineer, usually on small planes, not big planes, or to operate a derrick in oil or gas mining. Much, much higher fatality rate per 100,000 people than donating an organ. And we let people do those things for money all the time. So there is a logical argument that it would be consistent to let people sell body parts. I skipped a slide and I wanna go back to it because this is pretty interesting. There are some practices available today which look a little bit like markets. The first one you can see, the first slide are paired donations. Let us say that my husband needed a kidney but he and I are not a match. We're not biological relatives and we're not the same blood type. And that's actually true in my family. My husband and I would not match, but I would like to save his life. What if I can give a kidney to someone else's spouse and they could give a kidney to my husband, Don? A, a clean swap like that. And we've been doing those for a lot of years. More complicated on the other side of the chart are chain donations. What if a non-directed altruistic donor, somebody uh, who does something a little higher up on the altruism chain than what I did, says, take my kidney, find a match, and then they give it to someone whose spouse or close relative gives their kidney, and their spouse or relative gives their kidney. The longest running chain in our country has over 100 transplants to its credit at the University of Alabama in Birmingham how one non-directed altruistic donor can start an entire cascading chain like that. And now we're starting to see vouchers. The University of California at San Francisco has been pioneering this. UCLA is starting to do a little bit of this. What if one of my kids has a condition that means they might need a kidney someday in 10 years, in 20 years? Well, I'm gonna be way too old to donate then. But what if I give a kidney now to someone who needs it, and in return, the hospital gives me a voucher in my child's name, my adult child's name, and so that in 10, 15, 20 years, if one of my kids needs a kidney, they have a voucher that takes them right to the top of the list. All these things are being done today already. They are legal, but they certainly raise the question, wouldn't it be simpler if we just traded in cash? All these things are manipulating ways to get around the idea of selling organs, but they certainly are markets. Someone is giving an organ in order to get something of value for someone else they love. They're not cash markets, but they're markets. The other way we could increase the number of organs is to nudge people along. And you all may have seen this, the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, their ladder. There are a lot of ways we can encourage people towards an action. And as you can see at the very top, we can eliminate choice. You must donate your kidney. Everyone in America who's healthy, you got to, you got to give away one. We're probably not going to do that. And we're probably not going to do what's on the bottom, which is do nothing. Instead, we start to creep up the chain. We educate we advocate, people post on social media, people like me give talks and say, I gave away a kidney and I'm just fine, you can do it too. And we start to move up the chain of persuasion to see if we can't encourage more people to take the step. Well, there's one of my favorite pictures. That's me and Deb the day after surgery. Uh, I was walking, so I went down the hall to see her. She wasn't walking yet, but she's smiling. And at the end of the bed, you can't see it in this picture, but I never forget, was the clear bag hooked up to the tube, hooked up to Dev, filling with golden urine. My kidney worked inside her almost immediately. It began cleaning toxins from her blood almost immediately. And while she had some hiccups with the medication regimen, and that's pretty common after transplant, it takes them a while to get it finagled just right, uh, our surgery was a complete success. And in fact, uh, not long after she, uh, she left the hospital and, and recovered and went home to Fort Lauderdale, Deb went on a very fancy cruise and she sent me 
a video. She was zip lining in the Honduras. So it's a lot of proof that you can give someone a great life, great adventure, great energy. I will say that my right kidney, which is still inside me, I think was a little jealous because it is never going zip lining. I am not doing that. It's Deb who's the great, great adventurer. Uh, the picture on the other side, Deb came to Kansas City about a year and a half after our transplant. Her parents still live here. And uh, she took me out for sushi. And, and that's our picture there. These are some of the lessons that I've learned in part going through my experience and also in my conversations with John as he helped me think about what happened. There are a lot of barriers to being a living organ donor. Some of them make a lot of sense. Medical barriers make sense. I had to go on hypertensive medication because my blood pressure was five points over their threshold and I had to agree to stay on it for the rest of my life before I could be accepted as a transplant patient. I had to agree to do something to make this safe for me. Many people are excluded because they aren't well enough to do this. I happen to have very high kidney function and perfectly formed kidneys. Who knew? I didn't even know until I started this. But there are people who can't donate for medical reasons. That makes sense. But there are psychosocial reasons that don't make sense. It doesn't make sense if you've ever talked to a mental health professional that you can't donate a kidney. It doesn't make sense that if you've ever smoked a little weed, you can't donate a kidney. We need to adjust our parameters to fit with the way people live their lives today. And at this point in our talk, John always says, they were worried about the pod. Nobody ever asked me how much liquor I might drink. Like that must have been okay with them, which of course is ridiculous. You could certainly be someone who, whose alcohol use should preclude them. So, so just some old fashioned stigma ideas that we need, to get, we need to get a handle on. The other barrier that I think is terribly important is financial. Insurance, whether it's the private health insurance of the recipient or Medicare, which is uh, where you go as a kidney patient if you don't have private insurance, pays for everything medical. I, I never saw a medical bill at all. Then. My blood draws were free. The bottle of laxative I had to drink before surgery was free. Every pill I took was free. But out-of-pocket expenses for travel are not reimbursed by the recipient's insurance. Uh, my husband missed 16 days of work between our driving back and forth to the Mayo Clinic and getting me to appointments and things like that, staying with me while I recovered. Nobody compensated him for those lost wages. Nobody paid for our cat sitter. You know, cost a little money for us to go up to Rochester, Minnesota so many times. We could afford those costs. We're upper middle class but many people cannot. And kidney disease by and large is a disease of lower resource people. It's highly correlated to obesity, to hypertension, to blood pressure issues, to other issues that are related to poverty and it disproportionately impacts black and brown communities. And so the odds of a family member of a kidney patient being able to bear those out-of-pocket burdens is low. Since I donated in 2018, there have been moves both in the, in the public sector and the private sector to provide more compensation for kidney donors, not paying for organs, but making them financially neutral, but very few of them come all the way to pay for all the missed work someone would have and every expense associated with it. And one of the things we advocate for quite strongly in this book, are the steps it would take to make being a living organ donor financially neutral. There are real world consequences to making it hard for people to donate. This is a study that was done in 2017 at Georgetown in Washington, DC. Out of 985 people who, have been, who first called a clinic to be considered as a donor, a third dropped out right away. Like, sorry, wished I hadn't called the, made the phone call. 20% proceeded to evaluation. Look at that huge drop. That drop is probably financial pressure. Somebody telling you you have to see a substance abuse counselor, making it too hard. And while I don't think I had any God-given right to donate my kidney to a stranger, 
I do think people have a right to try and save the lives of their family and maybe even of their friends. So in our book, John and I advocate that hospitals should treat donors like donors. Hospitals know how to treat financial donors. They send them birthday cards. They meet them at the front desk. They give them parking valet. They put their name on walls. I took a picture of the, of the donor wall at the Mayo Clinic, sorry. Um, that wall is not kidney donors. That wall is financial donors. But kidney donors are financial donors. Hospitals do make money on kidney donations. Uh, their surgeons get practice, they, they get prestige. Um, hospitals send a bill to the insurance companies. The only person who doesn't get compensated in the deal is the kidney donor. John likes to equate it to um, college athletes. Everybody else is making money, but the college athlete. Now we're loosening up there for letting people make money off their talent and their time. It seems possible that we could at least thank donors in both tangible and intangible ways that recognize the contribution they are making, not just to the individual whose lives they're saving, but to the entire system which they enable. The last thing I want to leave you with before I take your questions, I came to feel that living donors are a unique position in the medical system. We are patients. We, we seek medical care, not for our own need, but for someone else. We get cut open, we get stitched up, we get meds, but we're also part of the supply chain. And that is a unique position, which requires unique thinking and probably specialty handling. And from my experience, everybody was great treating me as a patient, but they didn't know how to treat me as part of the supply chain. And I think more thinking and more pilot programs are necessary to see if we can't make progress on that. So I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you so much, Martha. I really appreciate hearing about your experience and it, it has raised a number of, um, of uh, questions and discussion. Um, the first is to go back to the issue of, um, of insurance and coverage. Um, the, there were some questions about how that gets, who pays for it and you know, basically who makes money as well. And um, the here, it sounds like the insurance of the recipient covers the expenses for the donor. And I wanted to ask if that is in true tends to be the, the case overall. Um, and, but what about long-term issues that arise, particularly for the donor, that are not part of that, that there are perhaps health sequelae um, after the donation? Those are really good questions. So yes, the recipient's insurance, so Deb had United Healthcare Insurance, but you could have Blue Cross Blue Shield, you could have whoever you have. Private insurance absolutely covers all the expenses, medical expenses of the donor. And insurance companies want to do this. I, I don't know that people recognize that dialysis is so expensive that every kidney transplant we do in this country saves the payer about $150,000 over the life of the patient. It is cheaper to have two people have surgery and for the recipient to stay on immunosuppressant meds for the rest of their life than it is to keep someone on dialysis. So insurance companies have very strong incentive for transplantation to move forward. Kidney patients are very unusual. They are one of the very few conditions in this country where no matter what age you are, if you do not have private insurance, you are covered by Medicare. So Deb is 56, was when we started this process. She was not eligible for Medicare, but had she not had private insurance, Medicare would have paid for it. So the private payer gets saved. If you don't have private insurance, Medicare gets saved. And there was a great article in The Economist two years ago that basically argued that increasing living kidney donation could save Medicare billions of dollars. It's a really big number. You ask about downstream problems. Well, first of all, most kidney recipients don't have downstream problems. Uh, all the evidence says that living donors live as long as everybody else, have a slightly increased um, risk of end-stage renal disease later in life. 
but a slight increase of a very small number is a very, very small number. Um, it is not covered by the recipient's insurance if something should happen downstream, but something almost never does happen downstream. I think one of the great myths about living kidney donation is that it is dangerous. And when I said I was gonna do it, people said, oh, you could die on the table. Living kidney donors almost never die on the table. Um, there is some risk that if I'm in a car accident and my remaining kidney is damaged, I might be at greater risk. But let's face it, if I'm in that bad a car accident, it's probably gonna get them both. So the health insurance question has not really arisen. Let me tell you where it does arise, which is sometimes people are denied either life insurance or health insurance because they donated a kidney. And that's a real problem because it can keep you from all kinds of coverage. Uh, right now, the exchange is a, is a good answer to that from a health insurance perspective, but that has occasionally been a problem. Um, but I've sought no additional medical care for donating a kidney, and I do not expect to for the rest of my life. Um, okay. Um, there are a couple of um, people who comment they have been altruistic donors themselves, um, one of whom um, indicated that there are many hoops to jump through, and if I had not followed up myself, I would have not gotten to the end. Now that I'm post-donation, I have found that no one really cares if I follow up or not or have problems. Um, the other person indicated that they had the opposite experience. Um, the team was clear about my obligation to follow, follow up and make sure to follow up with me to get me scheduled. So just curious what your experience um, was or what you would recommend. Well, I'm glad there's some other members of the Living Donor Club on the call. That makes me happy. There's so few of us in the country that we don't always, this like might be a lot in one room. Um, as, I've, as I've given this presentation around the country, one thing I've learned is that experience is very individual. Um, it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency around best practice. Um, I found the clinic very slow in keeping me informed but when something was happening, then they were on it. But nobody called me every week to let me know how things were going. Nobody kept me engaged. Um, I had to do all that myself. And I'm pretty type A, pretty OCD. And I found I was more often prodding them than they were prodding me. After my donation, they stayed on me for two years, um, asked me to send up blood, send up urine, um, at the six month mark, I was invited back for a three day evaluation. Um, didn't have to come, but it was free medical care. And, you know, a free, free evaluation at the Mayo Clinic is not something to turn up your nose at. Um, today, my primary care physician, who knows I was a living kidney donor, once a year reminds me to get a blood test to check my creatinine level. But mostly it's, it's been on me. Um, I do think that clinics could be more responsive to the needs of their living donors and consider them part of their family. Um, I know if I called up to Mayo and said I had a problem, they'd hop to, I know that, but the, but the, the attention is not, is not coming the other way. Okay, thank you. Somebody did comment that the National Kidney Foundation now does a great job of re reimbursing uh, for travel expenses. So, so it's the National Kidney Registry, um, and they do, uh, but it's pretty complicated. You have to be part of their system, which means you have to be donating through them with one of their participating clinics. And it is typically not for relatives or friends, but it is typically for altruistic kidney donors. Most often someone who is donating to the pool to start a chain or a match through them. But that is correct, the National Kidney Registry um, is doing a really nice job of helping reimburse people. And in some cases, uh, to a level, to a limited extent for, for wages for lost work too. Um, they're a nonprofit. Hmm. They're not either part of the UNO system nor are they part of any of the clinic systems. Uh, they're paid by the kidney from clinics 
to, to keep that process going. So yeah, they're a really important player in this world. Wonderful. Um, we also do have a post from someone looking for a kidney for her husband or his husband um, and has a phone number listed in the chat. Should you uh, be interested or able? So that number is there um, from that individual. Um, a question, can you expand on what you mean by treating donors like they are part of the supply chain rather than only as patients? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you an example. Um, we didn't talk about this, but uh, our first surgery attempt failed. Um, our first scheduled surgery, I drove up to Mayo, went through a day's evaluation, chug lug the laxative, and at 9 p.m. I got a phone call that um, Deb was in the hospital and she was too sick to proceed. And um, they were calling off the surgery. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And they're like, mm -hmm. all we know is she's too sick. I don't know about you. Um, and it wasn't until later the next day when I could find my donor advocate and tell her the surgery had been called off and ask for some guidance. I, I, I was sort of this um, casual byproduct at some specific points in the process. Um, as it turned out, uh, Deb, had, Deb had a possible infection. They were gonna have to treat her um, do some things before we could proceed. And I went home to Kansas City. And then I got a call that said, she's good, be here tomorrow for the blood tests, we're gonna start again. And I said, I'm six hours away, this 3 p.m. Do you want me to drive through the night? And they were like, what do you mean you're six hours away? I said, it probably says in my chart, I live in Kansas City. It's like they lost track of the kidney. Um, I think if I had been a mechanical heart or a mechanical kidney, somebody would have known it's in Kansas City, it's not here. So that was just one example of, they kind of sometimes lost track of me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they eventually found me and we eventually did it. But mm -hmm. uh, a living kidney donor is not just a patient they are like an instrument or like a medication or like a pig's valve or a piece of metal. We're vital to the surgery process and you have to remember that all the time. Right. What are the downsides of an organ donation opt-in system like the one in Spain? So that's an opt-out system, meaning everybody's assumed in. Um, the downside is that families feel their individual um, cultures, religions, and preferences are not being respected. And of course, someone can opt out, but people don't like the idea that their body is automatically considered part of the organ pool unless they do something proactive to keep it out. So it, there's no medical or practical um, downside. It's cultural. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is the role of the ESRD program? I don't think I know and what that is. Tell the me. end stage renal disease program. Okay. So, so this is still something new to me. I'm not sure what that means. Somebody knows something I don't know. I could learn from this. The, I, I don't know exactly the focus of the exactly the the focus of the question but it does sound like it um perhaps the the understanding of the end stage renal disease folks who are doing dialysis and so forth and their um their role in um in promoting the um altruistic or in promoting donation so the role of dialysis centers in transplantation is complicated. Um, every dialysis patient who goes to transplantation leaves the dialysis um, network and leaves their business model. As it turns out, our dialysis clinics in this country are pretty good about trying to help people uh, get listed on um, get listed for transplants, but there's an inherent conflict and that's been um, mediated and it's been studied and the thought is that some clinics, uh, some systems of transplantation of dialysis clinics are better at getting their patients listed 
on the transplant list. Typically it's a nephrologist who gets you listed. And there's concern that uh, communities of color, people without significant resources who aren't um, having integrated nephrology care are less likely to get listed on the transplant list. And that's a, that's a, a real concern. Okay. Um, would you donate to a person who had failing kidney function due to poor life choices? That's a really interesting question. Um, when I called for Deb, I had no idea what her life choices were. So I was putting myself out there. Um, I guess, do you mean if when I met her, I found out that she was obese, refused to stay on a diet, wasn't taking her hypertension meds, and told me that from day one, she would not take her immunosuppressant drugs, how would I feel? And I guess the short answer is it wouldn't have been up to me. For a transplant center to keep someone on the transplant list, they have to be convinced that going forward, someone's choices will protect the organ. Um, what's really sad about that is that sometimes we take people off the list or don't put them on the list because we think they're too poor. Um, we think they can't get good food or they can't get good housing. Um, when I worked in the foster care system, uh, we had foster kids who were not put on the transplant list until we could get them adopted because they needed to be in safe permanent homes in order to be sure their medication regimen would work. So it's really the transplant center's um, decision. I have sometimes wondered what I would have done if when I met Deb, I didn't like her. I didn't have to make that choice because I liked her a lot. But what if she had spouted politics I found hateful? Um, what if she had been homophobic and anti-Semitic and I'm the Jewish mother of a gay kid? Uh, how would I have felt about that? But it didn't happen and I didn't have to make that call. Uh, and I'm pretty grateful it didn't happen. Um, okay, I have, and it sounds like there is a good CME module through the AMA on ethics issues in organ donation. Um, in the chat, there is a link that has been posted. Um, and so that may be of interest to those of you who also want to continue to um, work with these issues and, and go more in depth. Um, the also someone indicated, I have a friend who's in the fourth stage renal failure and is in need of a kidney. She has Medicare and they do not cover everything associated with a transplant. The meds she has to take after the transplant will not be covered. That always has been a conundrum for me of why would you do a transplant if you can't afford the medication, you know, they can't provide the medication to. So that is changing. Um, so they will cover for the first two to three years. And the idea, I think, is the transplant's supposed to get you well and you're supposed to go to work and then you're supposed to be able to afford health insurance. That, of course, doesn't always happen. Um, but uh, there is a new change uh, to the law and immunosuppressant drugs will be covered for the life of the kidney patient, but it doesn't go into effect for two more years. So if you fall in that donut hole, um, which my recipient does, uh, it's, a, it's a real, um, it's a terrible problem. Uh, but steps have been taken to address it, just not yet. Okay. Um, curious about the, someone asked about the, um, in the communication between you as a donor and the hospital team, um, that there's also a need to work with caregivers. Um, was, what was the treatment for your husband like in this process? There wasn't anything. I think they just, he was kind of like the chauffeur and the bank account, I guess. Oh. Um, Don, uh, he, he was asked to join me um, only when we talked to the financial counselor. So only the understanding that we had to say, yes, you know, we can afford this. We're not going to drop out at the last minute because we can't afford gas to get to the clinic. Uh, but no, he never did talk to a social worker or anyone else there. Um, they would ask me repeatedly if he was okay. But nobody asked him. And until this minute, I never once thought to ask him if he minded. So when we're done today, I'm going to ask my husband if he minded that no one paid attention to him. Um, there are many, many more. I'm looking through. Um, there are multiple other people who have been donors. And um, 
and talking about their experiences. I'm glad to hear that people um, who were donors at UC Health here have, have had such good experiences. Um, many people thanking you, Martha, for your donation and your advocacy and your presentation. Um, there are lots of comments and I'm sorry that we're not able to get to all of them in the interest of time, but thank you very much. This has been very enlightening, very helpful, um, and we really appreciate it. Um, we will have um, next month, we will be doing a presentation having to do with ethics in emergency medicine. Um, thank you all for participating. And once again, Martha, thank you very, very much for your donation and your presentation. We really appreciate it. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.